Hi, my name is James Murphy. I'm a consultant for Harbor Results located near Detroit, Michigan. And I'm going to briefly walk you through the January 2016 barometer results. So the automotive tooling barometer hosted by the OESA in conjunction with Harbor Results was created as a way to gauge how the automotive tooling industry is doing um, and what its forecasts are for the upcoming uh, quarters. So each time we do a theme, and this one is around OEMs, tier ones, and how they rank in the eyes of tool shops. A quick overview of demographics shows that 86 shops responded to this survey. Uh, the majority of them were mold shops, but 41% of them were die shops. As far as revenue range goes, um, pretty standard breakdown with a majority of them falling in the 5 to 15 million category as we would expect within the industry, but we do have some representation within some of the other revenue ranges. So a brief summary of what we'll cover in part one. One of the key things that jumped out at us was the amount of work on hold drastically increased from the previous barometer uh, last August from an average of 12% to 20%. Um, having said that, you know, over half of the tool shops that took this survey said more than 10% of their total work was on hold, which is a very significant number. Adding on to that, capacity utilization metrics and reported were flat, but I think that could be a misrepresentation of, of how shops potentially report out on capacity utilization, potentially hesitant to go below a 40-hour work week, which you know, would, would align with 80%. And then equipment utilization and overall throughput, as our personal experience goes, were most likely lower than 80%, and I'll touch on that. And finally, within part one, you know, sentiment was down. And for obvious reasons, the shops were fairly slow. Um, not a whole lot of uh, busyness going on in the last four months. But um, given the, you know, the tooling sourcing forecast that are uh, anticipated for 2016, uh, a vast majority of shops are optimistic about uh, the future. In part two of the, the uh, report out here, we'll talk about some rankings and cost drivers within the supply chain. Uh, one key takeaway for the rankings is that Honda remained the, uh, the top OEM to support, according to the tool shops. But also the Detroit-based OEMs, FCA, GM, and Ford made some pretty substantial gains over the last 12 months. Uh, and then jumping into some of the cost drivers, you know, the OESA and Harbor Results spoke with uh, automotive makers, uh, tier ones, and tool shops to understand where do they believe cost is coming in in the supply chain and what could be done to remedy the situation. Looking at overall work on hold, you can see the breakdown here. Uh, how to read this chart, if you look at the bottom x-axis, 1 to 10%. That would be work on hold. Having said that, 46% of shops in August said that uh, 1 to 10% of their work was on hold. 31% of shops in January of 2016 said 1 to 10% of their work on hold. And you can see a shift from the left to the right, which is bad, uh, going from 35% to 49% saying that more than 10% of my work was on hold. And that causes a lot of issues, whether it's from a staffing uh, perspective and, and cost containment, really. So, you know, if, you, if you, you bottle that all together and say, what does that mean for the industry? You know, we anticipate that's somewhere around a $2.3 billion impact uh, industry-wide. And equivo you know, equivalently speaking, that's somewhere around 100 tool shops sitting, sitting idle during this time. Looking at utilization uh, in respects to you know, what happened over the last four months, you can see the utilization trended across overall average, uh, assembly, machining, and design. All were flat in the very low 80s. Um, and I think this has something to do with how we asked the question in, uh, in January of 2016. Typically, we would ask, hey, what do you believe your capacity utilization was? This time we asked you, how many people do you have in these functions and how many hours did they work? And then we assumed that a 50-hour work week was standard, 
And what we found was that a lot of shops said they were at 80%. Uh, Harbor Results has been in well over 30 shops in Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. over the last uh, three to four months, and our belief is that this number realistically was, was lower, and you could see a dotted lines for where we thought it might be. Looking at overall tooling sentiment, uh, what this is is a representation of how shops have felt uh, given a scale of very pessimistic to very optimistic. Um, with 50% being neutral. You can see how it's kind of been cyclical over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, well, we went from a 73 to a 66, which is a seven point drop since the last barometer. Not really surprising. I think the thing we'll have to look for here is the bounce back. Um, you look at April 2015 and how it went from 56 to 73. Uh, in our experience, this was because shops were still quoting but what we've seen over the last three to four months is that there's also been a, been a quoting decline in the industry. So that might inhibit some of the ability for the industry to experience a, a strong bounce back in a short amount of time. Looking a little forward, we can see that a majority of shops are optimistic about the future. So when given the question, you know, how do you feel the, the next uh, four to four or so months will go? you can see that there's overall quite a bit of optimism. You know, I have a breakdown here between shop type and then a breakdown between revenue range. Um, you can see that it's fairly close. Not a whole lot of outliers here, but you can see the bulk of shops in that five to $15 million range are overwhelmingly uh, fairly positive as to what 2016 holds. So we're gonna jump into OEM rankings. And what we did here for a second consecutive year was we asked uh, seven or so categories, which I'll get to on the next slide, as far as let's rank the, the OEMs that you support on a scale of one to five. And then you can see the aggregated average scores here. You can see that Honda is the top score on the chart on the right with a score of 3.7. And the lowest score, Volkswagen, at a 2.7. So what four would equal is good, three would be neutral, and one would be very bad. You could see that uh, the top score five, no one was, was close to that. No one even reached a four, but uh, Honda did lead the pack for the second consecutive year. Uh, bringing your eyes over back to the left, we can see average score by OEM type broken up into three distinct categories, the Detroit three, the Asian four, and the European three. You can see that the, the Detroit 3 has made some, some pretty good progress uh, over the last year or so. And this is a quick uh, breakdown of the specific categories that we talked about, so, you know, all the way from capacity planning through early involvement into, into design. Um, you know, if you want to spend some more time reading this chart, go ahead and pause the presentation. Uh, you can see how the number of respondents stacked up, the overall average, and where some hot and cold areas are with green being good, red being bad. And then this chart just quickly shows how the OEMs have ranked from January 2015 to January 2016. You can see that Honda maintained first, but then you can see a little bit of movement throughout the, uh, the other positions all the way through. And then the overall average score, fairly flat. jump into some of the supply chain cost drivers. Uh, the OESA and Harbor Results spoke with OEMs, Tier 1s, and tool shops, and we asked them, where do you believe are the top cost, or what do you believe are the top cost drivers that are being introduced throughout the supply chain? And this is something we really want to understand and figure out what can be done about it. So here we have the tool shop's perspective, and what they said about what the OEMs did to cause cost drivers was poor initial designs, and then additional specifications and tolerances. Uh, you'll bring your eyes over to the right. What are the tier ones doing? Uh, the top thing that Toolshop said was communication, specs and tolerances, and then initial design. So we do have some commonalities there. And then a thought starter here at the bottom, you know, GD&T and specifications happen to rank the highest among OEMs, but we can see that they, uh, Toolshops believe that that is one of the major cost drivers. The question that we asked tool shops was, you know, how accepting are your tier ones to suggestions that you bring to them? Um, you can see that only 47% of tier ones were open to suggestions around tolerancing or GD&T, all the way up to 92% around process feasibility. 
Moving on, another question that we asked them was, how often does your tier one involve you in OEM meetings? And the vast majority, 51% said never or rarely, 23% said a moderate or great deal, or what we would qualify as frequently. And if you kind of look at a breakout of that 23%, uh, the majority of them are mold shops, with 9% of them being dye shops. Now, if we look at the tier one's perspective, they believe OEMs are causing additional cost around engineering changes and kickoff delays. This really shouldn't come as a surprise. And then what are tool shops doing? Uh, as far as what did tier one say? You know, capacity, lead time can be additional major cost drivers. Obviously, when you, know, you think about kickoffs and engineering changes happening upstream, then being pushed downstream, you might see a compression as far as when the tool is expected to be delivered, which would increase the cost from the tool shop's perspective. And then finally, we talked to the OEMs to understand where do they believe uh, a cost are becoming a factor in. For tier ones, you know, they said excessive design standards. You know, typically, they were over specking in, in terms of materials or extra components. You know, for example, they might want some additional drops in the mold when that might be required or a blank space in the die. Um, and then you can see that one of the things that they spoke about quite frequently was just a lack of a shop supply base. They really would just go to the same shops over and over again. There wasn't a robust uh, process for finding new shops that could do the work uh, for various reasons. And then what did the, uh, the OEM say about the tool shops? Um, one of the key things that really uh, jumped out to us was standard components. And what we've seen over the last several years is shops are going to more standard components, but just aren't there yet. And then the tool shops believe there's a little bit of um, insufficiency within the quoting process. And kind of how we interpreted that was, you know, some of the tool shops do not have a very clear understanding of how much it's going to cost to produce a tool for, you know, various reasons. So therefore, there might be a buffer there. Now, if we kind of look at the breakdown real quick, you have OEMs in the top. This is just kind of a brief idea of how the supply chain operates. You can see where quoting process uh, factors into that, late changes and payment terms. But you know, some of the main commonalities that we saw were specs and tolerances, initial design, and communication. So what are the key things that shops can do to help in this process? Kind of the key stuff that we received was around streamline quoting and use of standard components. But at the same time, tier ones and OEMs are going to have to do stuff as well. Tier ones being in the middle are going to have to have a lot more effective communication. And OEMs are really going to have to cut down on the amount of changes that are happening and try to limit when possible the amount of kickoff delays. And really, what does the underlying thing go to between this? Trust. So a couple of key takeaways from this was, you know, a lot of work was on hold over the last four months. We saw a pretty significant jump of eight points, uh, leading to a pretty, a pretty good drop in capacity utilization. Quite a few shops are hovering around 40 hours a week, and we've also been working with shops that are below 40 hours a week. But having said that, quite a few shops are optimistic about the future. In the OEM ranking section, Honda remains number one, but we do see some pretty strong uh, potential from the Detroit 3. They've shown some incremental improvements. But, you know, at the same time, capacity planning and payment terms still linger as major pain points for shops. And then finally, we talked about cost drivers within the supply chain. You know, the common theme overall was just to, there's just overly complex tooling. And then there's also quite a few unnecessarily, unnecessary tolerances that are driving cost up. And then what could really help with this is around better communication and trust to create a more stable foundation moving forward. Just want to thank you for your time. If you have any other further questions, feel free to get a hold of me. My name is James Murphy. Uh, you can see my contact information on this slide, and I look forward to hearing from you.